Basically, remember, we've covered the history where pagan Rome has fallen and Christianity has overcome the pagan Rome, Satan's system. So then Satan had to raise up Constantine to mix up paganism with Christianity, and that's, <clears throat> and that's how the Roman Catholic Church monster was born. But if you recall in our last discipleship video, uh, underneath the bottom of the church, throughout the entire time before the Roman Catholic Church and Constantine came out, there were two evil forces that corrupted the church. And the key thing is wrong doctrine. That's why it is so important to stand for right doctrine, because it just takes a little bit of wrong doctrine here and here and here, and then you give it 300 years, then you become the Roman Catholic Church monster that damns billions of souls to hell. There's already plenty of wrong doctrine within less than 100 years in our world. And then if a person says to me, Pastor, I don't like how you're uh, attacking this pastor, crit criticizing this preacher, addressing this doctrine as wrong, why can't we unify? Hey, no, this has to be addressed because then pretty soon you give it 300 years, you get a Roman Catholic Church monster that damns billions of souls to hell. So wrong doctrine had to be addressed on the spot, and that was the problem of the local churches at that time. So they weren't addressing those wrong doctrines. The church of Ephesus did. Smyrna was too busy with persecution. And then the two powerful forces, they were busy behind the scenes creating the corruption within churches. They were the church fathers, one, and then Alexandria, Egypt. Those are the two dark forces that gave birth to the Roman Catholic Church that eventually came out. All right. So... We're going to go a little bit back to the past and then see what's going on over here. So first of all, if you look at Revelation chapter 2, if you look at Revelation 2, notice that from verses concerning about the church of Ephesus, at verses 1 through 7, the church of Ephesus, they had a zeal for the Lord and a love for the Savior. So we see that undoubtedly. But there was a problem here. The problem was is that they forgotten their first love. So that was their issue. That's the same thing with current Bible believers today, is that we might have a zeal for the Lord, but we leave out our first love. And when you leave out your first love, then eventually the church is going to die out. So it is important that you have just the right spirit as well, not just, a, not just standing for right doctrine, but you got to have the right spirits as well. Amen. So that is extremely important to understand. Another issue that was a problem was that notice that there was false doctrine arising ever since the church of Ephesus. Now, did you notice that? There was false uh, doctrine arising that time. So notice that if you keep looking at, down at the church of Ephesus, you'll see Nicolaitans. Do you see that in the passage there? The Nicolaitans mentioned. So they are the Nicolaitans. Then you also have another group, which was apostles who are liars. You see that? So there's already people within the Ephesian church trying to corrupt the churches with their wrong doctrine. Now, Nicolaitan, that, that's a clue of a Catholic hint that started within 0 to 100 AD. There's one of your first Catholic hints over there. And you saw it. That, that is what? It is Nicolaitan. That means above the laity. Now, if you notice that in Constantine's timeline and then the Roman Catholic Church power, that is what they are. They are above the laity. They idolized, they practically worshipped uh, the clergy. So that was extremely dangerous. Then you get the Church of Smyrna, which was going through tremendous persecution at verses 8 through 9, uh, 8 through 11. During that timeline of the persecution under Smyrna, which would go from 100 to 300 A.D., that time, the church fathers, they were all busy writing. But the Christians, during that time, the Bible believers, they're all running around and hiding. So because writings survive pretty much, especially when you have resources and education, then your teachings can continue and, and spread. So that was where? That was at Alexandria, Egypt. And then that's where these church fathers, a lot of them receive their corruptions from Alexandria, Egypt. You got to watch out for these church fathers, especially from the region of Alexandria, Egypt. Amen. So these are the two dark forces that the devil used to destroy the church 
And then it gave birth to this Roman Catholic Church power. Now, what we're going to do is that uh, let's look at the dark forces of corruption that was rising. Because now we're coming to Pergamos at verses 12 through 17. Pergamos, if you don't understand the meaning over there, Pergamos, the idea and their name is referring to uh, sitting down with the world and compromising. That's what you're going to find out with Pergamos. Pergamos, their issue was, is you'll notice that verse 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Now you notice that? Satan has a seat and Pergamos was busy working. Notice there was a martyr who was slain and did not, not deny the Lord where Satan's seat was at verse 13. Now think about it. During that timeline, which city would you consider to be Satan's seat that was having martyrs and martyrs of Christians? It's obviously Rome. That's a no-brainer if you're going to think about the historical timeline. So that's why we know that this is referring to Rome, Satan's seat. So there were martyrs that time. But notice now they're endorsing the doctrine of verse 14, Balaam. Now they're endorsing the doctrine of Balaam. To eat things, what? Sacrifice to idols and to commit fornication. So notice over here that they were, they were doing idol sacrifices and there was fornication going on. Now, if you look up that word fornication in Revelation 2 and compare that with Revelation 17 fornication, yeah. who is Revelation 17 referring to? That woman, that city on seven hills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's Rome. Rome is known as the city on seven hills. Yeah. The fornication, if we're going to compare Revelation 2 and 17, then it would be referring to that Roman Catholic uh, perversion, where the nations are fornicating, sitting down with the pagan Rome. Babylon the whore. So notice over here that it has the false doctrine of Balaam. Balaam is a false religious leader. Whenever his name is brought up in the Bible, it would be a reference to a false prophet one. Balak, we see there, is a false king, political power. So notice you have a false political power and a false religious power. Why? During the timeline of Pergamos, that would perfectly fit what? The Roman Catholic Church. Notice that they in finally endorsed what? Verse 15, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. He warned all the way at the church of Ephesus. See that? That Catholic heresy, that time that was rising. So we see Pergamos, they were sitting down with the world that time. Now, let's see in history how this came about to be. We talked about Philo, right? Philo yeah. at Egypt during the Old Testament time period. He was the one that was a bad influence to the Old Testament saints. Yeah. But let's keep reading about Alexandria, Egypt. So what was Satan trying to give birth from this place? Durant said the following in page 136 of Widowson's book of Egypt's 8,500,000 population. Its capital had now some 800,000, second only to Rome. In industry and commerce, it was first. Everyone in Alexandria is busy, says the letter. Questionably, Hadrian's. Everyone has a trade. Even the lame and the blind find work to do. Here, among a thousand other articles, glass, paper, and linen were produced on a large scale. Alexandria was the clothing and fashion center of the age, setting styles and making the goods. The Emperor Hadrian settled the matter more clearly when he said, quote, money was the people's god. The city also had a library that was famous throughout history, containing over 700,000 papyrus rolls, which the Muslim invaders several centuries later, later used to heat the city's baths for several months when they burned them. Alexandria was also noteworthy in that Durant tells us that an ancient commentator referred to Alexandria as the house of Aphrodite. And you want to trust Alexandria with your scriptures? you got to be kidding me. So remember, modern Bibles, for some of you who don't know, Modern Bible versions come from Alexandria, Egypt. Your NIV, your ESV, NKJV contain some of the readings from this 
awful place. This is the homeland of modern Bible version today. That's why we are King James only -ist. Why? Because we believe in a pure line that comes from Antioch, not from Alexandria, Egypt. Amen. So Alexandria, Egypt is responsible. Uh, let me know if I'm out of bounds, gentlemen. It is responsible for modern Bibles today, modern versions. So Satan, he had to attack the authority first, the Word of God. And notice that he used education to start the downfall of the church. Uh, wait a minute, if we were to lo look back just a couple hundred years, what caused the fall of the Great Awakening revivals in America? What caused Christians to have a flood of modern Bible versions? What caused the revivals to die out and entertain worldliness? Why it started with schools, yeah, yeah. started with higher intelligence. What is, remember, what's the sign of a New Testament true church? It is anti-intellectualism. That is very important to understand. Amen. So we already know that this is already a red flag with the history of Alexandria. It, Alexandria is the house of Aphrodite, dedicated to the worship of the great goddess known as Venus, Diana, Ishtar, and other names which is so prevalent in history. The feminine side of Satan, the great deceiver and enemy of all that is good and holy. Look at that. Alexandria was carrying that spirit all the way back in our world history class of Semiramis and Nimrod religion. Yeah. So notice Nimrod religion reared its ugly head because one of his kingdoms was dying out, pagan Rome. So then Alexandria carried on Nimrod's spirit. Let's keep reading over here. In the late second century, a theological school is established at Alexandria that will be the source of a great deal of corruption of biblical manuscripts. How about that? So now let's uh, jump. So this is during the ancient BCs. Now let's jump a little bit toward the early ADs as we continue the story of Alexandria. So this was happening during the BCs, how Alexandria was born and birthed. And I covered a little bit more of that in our previous discipleship class. Let me continue talking about Alexandria. The following reads... Let's see. George Park Fisher in the History of Christian Doctrine makes this statement, found at page 147 of Widowstone's work. It was at Alexandria, the seat of all science, that philosophical theology first acquired a firm footing. The union of philosophy and theology, of which we see the beginnings in the apologists, was there consummated. Cate uh, oh, catech oh, whatever. <laughs> when cultivated and inquisitive heathen converts were to be taught, necessarily assumed a new form. The school for catechumens developed itself into a school for the training of the clergy. The Alexandrian teachers met the educated heathen on their own ground. You hear that? The Alexandrian teachers met the educated heathen on their own ground. Instead of pouring out invectives after the manner of Tertullian against the Greek philosophers. So Tertullian was one of those church fathers Remember, he's the one who gave the statement, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Mm -hmm. That guy, Tertullian, was the one attacking. He's saying, no, this, this anti-intellectualism right here. He was the one bringing about that point, but uh, they ignored his warning. They recognized the teachings of the Greek sages' materials which Christian teachers might accept and assimilate. Now look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2. What did the Bible warn? Now, this is the timeline of Ephesus. Paul wrote it during the early first centuries. He warned the Christians, but the Christians failed to listen. They united philosophy with their uh, Christianity. Look at Colossians chapter 2. We'll read verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through what? Philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, yep. after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's what they did. Let's keep reading. Concerning about Alexandria, it reads the following. In page 148, as the Christian era began, the Alexandrian Jew Philo, combining Jewish religious ideas with Greek philosophy, 
emphasize the mystical quality of man's relationship to God. Red flag, red flag. Philo influenced two late second century Greek fathers of the church, Clement of Alexandria and his pupil Origen. These are two names you want to know. So besides Philo, Dr. Upman mentioned in his church history book, these are the guys who corrupted the most. And they are out. church fathers, that the ones that are the most dangerous are from Alexandria, Egypt. So these are the guys that you want to avoid, the church fathers from Alexandria, Egypt. So then Philo, let's consider him as the one at the BCs, right? So we'll put him at parentheses. But then these are the names that are really, really bad apples here. And that's Clement. Clement, yep. And then the other one is Origen. So is it an E? I think it's an E. So yeah, Origen. All right. So Origen. So these church fathers who came from Alexandria, Egypt, now this is getting really dangerous here. Mm -hmm. So let's keep reading. Because they are two bad forces that now become one. It keeps reading the following. These two, in turn, headed Alexandria's catechetical Christian religious school, where both Christian and pagan Greek writings were studied and where the philosophy later known as Neoplatonism evolved, although Neoplatonism was a pagan philosophy and origin after his death was disowned by the church as a heretic. Much of the mysticism of the Alexandrian school of theology was absorbed into Christian thinking. To sum up the disdain of the Christian who loved the Bible had for the Alexandrian brand of mixing pagan philosophy with Christianity, Tertullian said, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? <laughs> Why? Because they have no relationship whatsoever. But then see that what they're doing is that they're mixing up here. They don't care. They want to mix up Greek pagan philosophy with where the Christian church had started early on at Jerusalem and then spreading on to Antioch and other places. Origen became the headmaster of the school as still teenager, apparently 18 years old. Wow, see, that's why a lot of people look up to this guy. And immediately threw himself into Greek philosophy. He also was very eccentric and even castrated himself in a perverted interpretation of Matthew 19.12, hoping to avoid future temptation. <laughs> So this guy did not know about the doctrine of dispensationalism, as you might have realized. <laughs> yeah, because this one's the wrong dispensation in Matthew 19. That was referring to the timeline of the millennial kingdom. So you notice over here that the heretical doctrines that you're going to find out, they were not what the Christian church was. As I taught you before, one of the tenets of New Testament true Christian church is a literal interpretation of the Bible, right? And if you tend toward that direction, you go toward what? Premillennialism, dispensationalism. So Origen, because he was not like that, that's why he came out of bad apple. Alexandrian school is infamous for metaphorical interpretation, not literal. He died resulting from injuries received in the Decian persecution after being tortured in 249 AD. He wrote so copiously that he left 6,000 volumes of work, quoting the scriptures that all would eventually be saved after a time in hell, even Satan himself. Wow, sounds like Ellen G. White. Sounds like a seventh, good old Seventh-day Adventist, right? <laughs> As strange as this may seem, Origen was one of a handful of teachers who had the most influence on Christian thinkers throughout the ages. That's what you've got to understand. So modern Bible version scholars, a lot of Christian theologians today, a lot of their thinking and ideology is from Origen. Even today, his method of allegorical interpretation and his admixture of the scripture and philosophy is, prefer, is preferred and praised by many Christian scholars. Origen influenced Bible translations by taking several post-resurrection copies of the Hebrew scriptures, including the non-canonical Old Testament Apocrypha. Remember I warned you about that Apocrypha? That's garbage, which had been rejected by the Jews themselves as being inspired. 
that had been translated to Greek and laying them out side by side and composing his own. I mean, this guy must be very humble, right? I'm going to make my own Bible. So this version of the Hebrew manuscripts translated into Greek became known as the Septuagint after a legend that an Egyptian king had brought Hebrew elders to Egypt to translate the sacred works into Greek for his own Jewish population, which, as at Alexandria, had become Hellenized. Many Bibles today use Origen Septuagint through such manuscripts as the Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, and Alexandrinus to translate the Old Testament rather than the Hebrew manuscripts that Jesus and the apostles quoted. For instance, Jesus refers to such Hebrew grammatical terms as jot and tittle, which would not be found in the Greek language in Matthew 5.18, and brackets the Jewish scriptures between Genesis and 2 Chronicles in Matthew 23.35, which is the order the Hebrew Bible was written with 2 Chronicles as the last book having no Apocrypha. So I hope you've heard this. These are important arguments against the Septuagint. So this is where your fabled Septuagint comes from. So this Septuagint, like a serpent, it is debunked by the following. What's the following? Well, it's supposed to be supposedly a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament that happened during the BCs. But you can tell Jesus didn't condone this. Why? Because uh, one, Jesus, he mentioned jot and tittle at Matthew 5. Those are Hebrew wordings there. Jot and tittles. That's referring to Hebrew wordings. So, that's, so Jesus did not recognize the Greek Old Testament over here. Another thing is Matthew chapter 23, verse 35. So Matthew 23, 35 is another passage that would debunk the Septuagint. So what debunks this is the following, Matthew 5, 18, jot and tittle. The second one is Matthew chapter 23, 35. That's referring to the order of the books in the Hebrew Old Testament, Hebrew Old Testament. Not English, but Hebrew. The English Old Testament, where our King James Bible came from, was translated from Hebrew later on. So we got the right translation. We didn't choose the Greek version, obviously, the Septuagint. So over here, Matthew chapter 23, verse 35, Jesus recognized the authority of the prophets who spoke God's words. He says the blood of righteous Abel, so that's Genesis, all the way to the blood of Zacharias that he slew at the altar. That's 2 Chronicles. So, I'm, so you might say, so that's the entire books of the Old Testament in our King James Bible that matches with the Hebrew Old Testament. You might say, but don't ours end in Malachi? The order is different, but the number of books is the exact same. See, the number of books is the exact same, it's just that the orders are different. They choose to end in 2 Chronicles. So if the King James Bible chooses that Hebrew Old Testament that has those kind of books, then we must be in the right, then the King James Bible must be translated correctly, right? It's a correct translation. But then these modern versions who would uh, try to boast about the Septuagint and Origen's workings, if they use those works for their translations, then we know, ooh, red flag, get out of there. That's the wrong Bible then. Let's keep reading. The Apocrypha was rejected for many reasons by the Jews. None were written in Hebrew. They proposed statements in contradiction to the rest of the scripture. I'm not going to read that because I already debunked the Apocrypha. Apocrypha, in our previous discipleship videos, is baloney, and I've given you evidence for that. The Septuagint, now I'm giving you some arguments against the Septuagint. So then this means this is not a B.C. writing. Amen. Origen's the one who created this, according to the work over here. You might say, no, it's a, it's, it's a writing that existed in the B.C.s, in Greek. It really existed. Then why didn't Jesus recognize it? He, rec he did not recognize it. The main evidence for the existence of a B.C. Septuagint is a document called the Letter of Aristeus. This letter can be read free online and can be examined closely. It is supposed, okay, so let me write this. That way you all can research. So 
So you can read it free online, and then you guys can examine it yourself. So that's the evidence for your uh, BC uh, dating of the Septuagint. It is supposed to detail the way that the Egyptian king went about having the Old Testament translated into Greek. However, many consider this to be a fraud, possibly perpetuated by Philo himself. Hmm. As it contains many factual errors and cannot have been written by the person who is given credit, credit for writing it. To not belabor the point for this class, the head librarian of the great library, who supposedly oversaw the project, did not serve under the king in question. There are many other issues that make many scholars consider this letter a fraud, although you will find just as many who consider it to be perfectly legitimate. Go and make your own decisions. With regard to the Septuagint itself, it is believed by some to be the efforts of several Christian era church leaders to rewrite the citations in the New Testament of the Old Testament back into the Old Testament itself to attain some type of uniformity that suited them. I think that sounds logical because these church fathers, they wanted to try to unite with philosophy, the education of the secular world that time. So they wanted to help out the Christians. By what? Corrupting God's word? That's not helping. That's flagrantly lying, man. Now look at 2 Corinthians 2. Paul warned this. This was occurring during the timeline of Ephesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many. Now did you see that? It said many. That means there were so many corruptions during Paul's time. Which corrupt the word of God. But as of sincerity. But as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Now, are you being a very sincere, honest person translating when you're uh, blatantly lying in the translation to try to meet up secular education standards, etc.? No, that's still a lie. Maybe God just wanted you to be away from secular education. You thought about that, Mr. Church Father? But see, they adore secular education so much they want to unite it. Many times in the New Testament, the writers simply paraphrase Old Testament verses. Remember, to the Roman mind, this is unacceptable. Unity and uniformity are the hallmarks of Roman thinking. However, this too is a contentious idea, but that is part of the fun of studying history. It is a great experience in detective work, and often investigators studying the same material come to different conclusions. So now we see the corruption of Alexandria, Egypt. So we know that this is not a good place. Now let's look at the timeline where cults were arising. So we see the church fathers trying to help out, but then now we see cults that arise. Now these cults, they sound very much like you might hear concerning about the esoteric groups, New Agers, Theosophists, etc., etc. Now remember, one of the main points of New Testament church Christianity is that it has to have a uniformity, a unity of Bible believers that is important. So we are not part, remember, we are not part of a trend where uh, we are dependent upon an organization. We are an independent, local, Bible-believing church. However, this does not mean that we end up like some fringe little rogue. So that is important to understand. No, there's a unity of believers and groups together. So these cults who are born, how you can tell they are cults is that they do not unite, they do not maintain the unity among Bible-believing uh, Christians. What they do is that they want to start their own little gig within a church, and then they get, become rebellious and they get kicked out. So then these are the following cults that have arisen. So the church fathers, a lot of them were trying to address the heresies that are arising from these cults. But you already see that both parties are guilty because we got the church fathers who are being corrupted with intellectualism, with the world, with Romanism. And then uh, you got the cults over here who are doing their own little gig because they want to be a popular cult leader on YouTube and gather a following because they just love power that much. So we get, so there's not much difference with today, you notice that. There's not much difference. You notice that? 
When I attack the heresies that is uh, preached amongst uh, mainstream Christian churches today, they would call me a heretic, they would call me a cult. And then when I address these rebel rogues who end up like cults, they accuse me of being like those mainstream uh, Christian churches that are worldly and Catholic and etc. See, you know, the, see, this is this is not much different than today. Yeah. Not much different than today. Mm -hmm. The favorite phrase, what men learn from history, is that men never learn from history because you're all stupid. I keep, I keep putting down mankind as stupid, stupid, and you'll hear me saying that over and over again. The reason why is I want to drill it into your stupid human pea brain heads. That way you don't end up like, uh, you don't get deceived by the devil. You don't do something wicked that makes you depart from the right Christian church movement. That is so important to understand. Now let's look at some of these pointers. Page 150. The early church had to deal with a great many heresies as evidenced by Paul's warnings and the warnings given by the Lord Jesus Christ in the first chapters of Revelation to the churches, right? One of the most important of these was what you want to know, Gnosticism, the continuing tradition of pagan mystery cults called mystery because of the secret method of initiation, secret rites, and secret knowledge they supposedly imparted. We have such groups today under various guises and names which seek with secret meetings, secret handshakes, and special instructions given only to the initiate. As a matter of fact, if you go to the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum, if you go over there when they talk about their heritage where they come from, yep. they mention these Gnostics during the timeline of Paul. The church leader, Irenaeus, described many of these Gnostic groups in his work against heresies. Modern Gnostic sects are ultimately occultic with only the members of the group having access to arcana or esoteric knowledge, which only a select few can either understand or even should have access to. But these modern groups often have a similarity in name only to the early Christian Gnostic groups. So you'll notice over here where you get your conspiracy elites with these people who would only understand certain language or certain workings, etc., etc., all these symbolism, it goes all the way to the timeline of the early Apostle Paul, the Christian church. So there's your pre-Illuminati experience already happening all the way to the timeline of the start of the Christian church. So notice Satan was a very busy being, raising up a lot of uh, wicked groups. You might say, why is he so busy doing that? Because Christianity was growing. So he had to confuse it by raising up so many different movements and religions. Why? Because he see pagan Rome is failing. So he had to raise up new brands. All right, let's keep reading. The early groups had more in common with the Babylonian and Greek mystery religions. More modern Gnostic groups of modern times are often referred to as New Age, a hybrid mix of Christian, Hindu, and pagan religious beliefs that ultimately are anti-scriptural and give man, and therefore Satan, Satan, preeminence over God, the Creator. Unfortunately, the modern Gnostic groups, whether nominally Christian or deliberately occultic and anti-Christian, have had a great negative influence on the modern church and have to be fought just as hard as the early Christians did, such as Irenaeus, who had to combat them. Their influence even in certain modern Bible translations, such as one that in Matthew chapter 11, verse 3, which probably unintentionally refers to the doctrine of the coming one, most clearly enunciated by the New Age priestess Alice Bailey, or the modern Bible that calls God the God of green hope, a pagan druidic reference with Lucifer commonly appearing as the Green One, according to Bierdemann's Dictionary of Symbolism in Romans 15.13, or one Bible which ignorantly mixes Lucifer, Satan's identity, with that of Jesus Christ in Isaiah 14, verse 12, and Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, which lines it up with Luciferian, Madame Blavatsky's statement that Lucifer is Christ in her landmark work, The Secret Doctrine. Now, notice back at Colossians 2. 
So Colossians 2 gave you a warning of the, these two groups, the church fathers, philosophy, and these cults, the Gnostics. Look at Colossians 2. See, the Bible warns you both groups in the same chapter. And the Christians failed to miss, they failed to see that. They thought it was one side or the other. Just like today, you know, in the elections, you're like one side or the other. You know, they always think that way. And uh, stupid Christians never learn from history. No, it's not one side or the other. It's the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the Bible side, a lot of times, it's not going to go for one side or the other. It'll be against both sides. Amen. It's the same thing with all other heresies you hear. All other heresies you hear. You, people think it's one side or the other. Calvinists ignorantly say, you're either a Cal are you a Calvinist or are you Armenian? It's like the same thing. It's like either lordship, salvation, or easy believism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Look, it's, it's in between there. Both sides are always wrong. That's what you're going to find out. And I notice that uh, when they criticize me for being extreme on one side, that's the same thing with the other side. They'll accuse me for being extreme on the other side. See? <laughs> now, Colossians chapter 2. Notice what the Bible warned at verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. See that? That's that esotericism. That's that mystery and only we would know, you cannot know. And then they have this adoration of angels and spirits and a voluntary humility. You know what that is? You know, you see these... Uh, weird initiations or then, you know, not much different from the Catholic Church, you know, how the monks lock up themselves. It's pretty weird stuff what they do against their body, right? That's all uh, aestheticism, etc. That's all fake humility that God does not honor. God does not honor that. That's not biblical. Now let's read another heresy that rose up during this time. Gnosticism was the most popular one that you want to know. Gnosticism during this time. The other, other early heresies were Sabellianism, which basically implied that Jesus was only divine without human qualities and could not have actually suffered and died. Docetism, similarly, implied that Jesus' humanity was only an illusion. Monophysitism separated the two natures of Christ that joined in one body, in contrast to the Bible's teaching that Christ was completely human and completely God, as if there was some kind of multiple personality disorder going on there. Yeah. Of the many other heresies, Arianism had the most impact then and today. You might say, which, how so? Arianism is this, with this basic concept that the Lord Jesus Christ was begotten as a God, a lesser God prepared specially for man's salvation. This had a large following early on and is present today in certain cultic Christian sects. Its credibility is found underscored in a modern Bible version that calls Jesus not the only begotten Son in John 1.18. Uh, let's skip that part. Uh, as much, I'm sure you might be interested in that. Most of the early church fathers quote only begotten Son, such as Ignatius, Irenaeus, and Tertullian, with Clement of Alexandria, the head of that school, and of course Origen, quoting it as only begotten God. How about that? Alexandria, Egypt. <laughs> Origen even quoted it both ways. Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus also quote only begotten God in opposition to thousands of other manuscripts and versions. And you really trust this Bible? You're nuts. So now we see that these heresies that were rising up. So the Catholic Church will claim that so we have to be thankful for the Catholic Church because the early centuries, they were battling these heresies. They were battling these heresies that were arising. But see, they're only looking at one side. It, both sides, God, see, has the problem. Right here. The Catholic Church thinks that being on this side is okay, and we're attacking the cults over here. That's dangerous. Got to watch out for that stuff. Now, I'm going to give you some evidences concerning about the early Christian church with their... So we first see during this time, we got a problem here. Two vital issues that you're going to distinguish us with 90% of churches. 
which is very, very important. I have given you the nine points of a New Testament true church where you can find that kind of group within early centuries to now. But I'm going to give you two main keys which will solve very easily among churches today. The first thing is the KJV issue. You have to be King James only. The second one is dispensationalism. These are two key things that you're going to find very easily that will solve wrong doctrine. And then you're going to pretty much find out that 99% of churches that you attend, if not 90%, uh, then it's filled with corruption, wrong doctrine. These are the two main things that you'll find out. Look up every YouTube channel and find out if they believe only in using the King James Bible. If they think modern Bible versions are the devil's Bible, do they recognize that or they refuse to admit it? The second thing is, do they recognize dispensationalism as a right doctrine? Do they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture? Do they believe in dispensational salvations? Do they believe in eternal security, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So let's see the evidence during early Christianity that builds up these two. If they had these two, then it would have rescued you from a ton of wrong doctrine during the early centuries. Widowson's work, page 149. But briefly, let us look at events in Antioch, Syria. Antioch was the city to which Hannibal had first fled from the Romans after his final defeat in 195 BC, according to Durant. Antioch, naturally, was where the first Christian manuscripts would be composed to spread all over the Greek-speaking and Latin-speaking world. The Old Latin Bible was thought to be first transcribed there, as were the documents that formed the basis of the Syriac Peshitta. Although some disagree, most of the writers I have referred to the early church leaders from Antioch as hyper-literalists, the online encyclopedia Wikipedia has this to say. Antioch gave its name to a certain school of Christian thought distinguished by literal interpretation of the scriptures in contrast to the allegorical interpretation which found its greatest expression at Alexandria. Amen. The authority of the Bible we have today can be underscored by many of the manuscripts written from or around Antioch and written in Syriac. For instance, an early church leader named Tatian wrote a harmonization of the Gospels called the Diatessaron, a harmonization of the Gospels with regard to the timing of events in the middle of the second century. Such verses as Luke chapter 2, verse 33, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him are reinforced by the fact that they could not have been later glosses or additions, as they were quoted and known early on in both the earliest versions of the Bible and in the writings of these early church leaders. Such controversial passages as Mark 16, verse 9 through 20, Amen. and 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 through 8 Amen. are found in the Old Latin and are quoted or alluded to in every century <coughs> of the early Christian era by teachers and preachers. Although faith does not require us nor permit us to search for relics or affirmation from historical sources to bolster it or to justify it, or it is not faith, these facts of evidence, even though hotly contested by Catholic scholars and Protestant scholars like Norman Geisler, who received their highest degrees from Catholic institutions of higher learning, reveal the clear line of true Christian manuscripts ascending from Jerusalem to Antioch and spreading from east to west over the entire Roman Empire. Modern liberal scholars label this the Byzantine text, and it is the foundation for our Bible represented by all but around 40 to 44 of the 5,200 manuscripts that contain the Gospel of Mark, only two manuscripts, Codex Vat Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, closely associated with Alexandria and Rome, do not contain this ending, and it is quoted and alluded to by early church leaders and versions in every century of the early Christian era. So, uh, briefly, the idea is this, is that, as you may have heard, so how we solidify this argument is because while Alexandria was producing its monsters, Antioch, which is also called the Byzantine text, They were the ones who carried on the KJV writings. But uh, the evidence is for this is the Greek manuscripts, Byzantine from Antioch. The second, there are other ancient witnesses that you might want to know that support 
the early century writings because scholars will claim well, that these writings are later. We go by Alexandria, Egypt because the writings are older. But the fallacy to that is the following. You can use these manuscripts. One is Old Latin. And then the second one is Syriac Peshitta. These are two ancient writings that are second century accounts, which, uh, which is competition against Vaticanus and Sinaiticus that they condone to be second century. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, these manuscripts that I mentioned, they're Alexandrian manuscripts. Mm -hmm as I have mentioned. Okay, so these are the ancient writings that bolster it. The book that I would recommend is by Jack Mormon, M-O-O-R-M-A-N, Jack Mormon, and he's the one that has the book, a uh, purple book, which is called um, Early Manuscripts, uh, Ancient Versions, and Church Fathers. It's something like that to that effect. So I would recommend that book if you want manuscripts that would support readings for your King James Bible. The second one that I would recommend is a book by, I think his name is Davis Otis Fuller, Which Bible? Which Bible? And then the, another book that I would recommend is Edward F. Hill's book. Edward F. Hill's book, which is called um, The King James Version Defended. So these people will attest to the ancient uh, witnesses of the writings of the King James Bible in a more scholastic manner. Uh, I would also recommend our playlist, Defending the KJV, Defending the KJV, and these can bring up any errors that is brought up by Greek scholars today, and then I would give the defense of the KJV writings. So you can look those up as well. All right, uh, concerning dispensationalism, we will cover that in our next discipleship classes. There were writings, ancient writings that supported dispensationalism. It wasn't some cult created by Darby. Without dispensationalism, you produce cults. That's the idea. Cults come out be without dispensationalism. So we will, uh, I will give you quotations that would support the writings of dispensationalism. And then we're going to talk about now, finally, Pergamus, what Constantine and later church fathers did to produce more of the Roman Catholic uh, monster system. And then the devil did something... Uh, the devil did something because this is where the Byzantine manuscripts came from, right? So then there's a church that brags to be older than the Catholic Church because it was East and Western churches that time. And that is known as where we later find out today as the Greek Orthodox Church versus the West Roman Catholic Church. And guess what they're both born from? It all started because thanks to stupid Constantine. Yeah. Can you believe that? Stupid Constantine was the one who started that mess. He was the one that started that mess. Satan did a really good job. He did a really good job with that. So during that timeline, where were the good guys? Hopefully I'll discuss some of the good guys during that time too that you'll like to hear. God my Father, I pray that uh, tonight's teachings were a blessing to the hearers concerning discipleship class. I pray that uh, you'll bless the next teaching that I'm about to give and then fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.